Ethan Mollick just published an essay where he writes, quote, recently something shifted in the AI industry. Researchers began speaking urgently about the arrival of super smart AI systems, a flood of intelligence, not in some distant future, but imminently. He kind of calls these signals collectively, quote, prophecies of the flood, which is the essay's title. Now, what makes all this interesting, he says, is that these rumors and signals are not coming from the usual tech hype cycle, but often from researchers inside major AI labs who appear genuinely convinced we're approaching a fundamental breakthrough, which we talked about a bunch last week in our super intelligence segment. So he talks about some of the signals that we also discussed, things like OpenAI's O3 model, uh, achieving 87% accuracy on a test where even PhDs with internet access only scored 34% outside their specialty. It's solving incredibly difficult math problems. It is performing well on the ARC-AGI test, and it's demonstrating fluid intelligence that can match or exceed human baselines. He also mentions we've started to see the emergence of practical AI agents. Uh, Malik especially talks about Google's Gemini with deep research as a prime example. Uh, we've talked about deep research quite a bit. For instance, he asked deep research to research startup funding methods. It analyzed 173 websites and produced a comprehensive 17-page report in minutes. So all of this, Malik believes, are these kind of prophecies of this flood of superintelligence coming. But despite all that, he says we should kind of temper excitement with realism. So even if the labs are right about reaching AGI, he argues the pace of actual adoption and integration into society will likely be much slower than the technology's theoretical capabilities. He also says that while AI researchers are focused on all the technical challenges around alignment and safety, there is way less attention being paid to how society should adapt to and shape the deployment of these technologies. So, Paul, like one of the themes that kind of keeps coming up, in my opinion, in these types of essays and the commentary from the labs seems to kind of fall into this bucket of like very few people really understand what's coming. Like, in your opinion, what is coming? Why do so few people seem to really get this? Yeah, I actually saw a tweet this week from, or last week from Vedant Misra, who I've, I've mentioned on the show before. He sold an AI company to HubSpot in 2017, which is when I got to know him. My agency at the time was still doing a lot of work with HubSpot. Um, spent two years on reasoning at OpenAI, and now he's a reasoning researcher at DeepMind. So he tweeted, there are maybe a few hundred people in the world who viscerally understand what's coming. Most are at DeepMind, OpenAI, Anthropic X, but some are on the outside. You have to be able to forecast the aggregate effect of rapid algorithmic improvement, aggressive investment in building reinforcement learning environments for iterative self-improvement, and many tens of billions already committed to building data centers. Either we're all wrong or everything is about to change. So I think you know, your question about like, maybe why don't people get it? He calls it out. Like they, they don't understand how fast these things are improving. They don't right. understand the concept of, um, self-improvement, recursive self-improvement. They don't understand the value of reinforcement learning to make these models really, really smart in specific domains and then more generally. And they don't comprehend how much money is already allocated over the next five years to building out these data centers, which as we talked about last week, are AI factories, they're intelligence factories. Mm. So when you take all that into consideration, now Vedant was actually a closing keynote at our Macon 2022 event. And I asked him uh, in that session, why are you working on this? Like, because again, AGI in 2022 wasn't common conversation. <laughs> and so I knew Vedant's background. So not only did he build and sold an AI company, he, he was at Columbia University in theoretical cosmology, experimental astrophysics, and experimental particle physics. This is a really smart dude. So he could literally be doing anything in science and AI and business. Why are you working on reasoning and, and AI. And he said, it just kind of summarized, because I believe a, a future of abundance is possible and AGI is how we get there. And so he said, like, there's people like me who believe AGI is within reach and we want to build it. We want to see it there. So I say that for context, because then Sam tweeted on January 10th, which I think goes to what Ethan is saying. So this is the tweet from Sam. 
prediction, the O3 arc. So O3 is this model that sort of set off the, uh, the forthcoming model that sort of set off all this conversation on superintelligence in the last three weeks. The O3 arc will go something like this. One, oh, damn, it's smarter than me. This changes everything. Ah, 10 minutes pass. Two, so what's for dinner anyway? 10 minutes pass. Can you believe how bad O3 is and slow? They need to hurry up and ship O4. And I think that's what happens in like this world. It's like we have these, this insane alien intelligence and like it's amazing. And then you just sort of go on with your life and you just like forget how incredible it is. So I was, I was actually sitting this morning with my wife. I was trying to get ready and like drinking my coffee and getting ready for this podcast. And I was trying to like conceptualize how to explain to someone. So I, I bounced this off of my wife. I was like, hey, would this make sense if I was just like explaining this to you, like what's happening? So bear with me for a second here, Mike. Tell me if this makes sense. So I think what's happening is many leaders still struggle to grasp the capabilities and potential impact of our current generative AI capabilities. So let's take one person on your team. We could do this with any business. Mike and I have done this. Like, give me any business, give me any team member, any person in an organization. We're going to assess what they do for their job. We're going to take like the 80%, like what are the three to five things you do for 80% of your work? Mm. And then we're going to build three custom GPTs and train them how to use those GPTs to do what they do every day more efficiently. So let's assume we take a single employee, we break down their job into tasks, and then we build three custom GPTs to help them do their job. You will unlock a minimum of 10% efficiency gains in their job within, I, I, I would, I'm trying to be conservative here. I'm gonna say 90 days, but it probably within nine days. Like mm. this could happen fast. So I'm being intentionally conservative to prove a point. Um, I think in many jobs today, that could easily be 20 to 30% gains if they're properly trained how to use these tools. So let's play this out for a second. Estimate there's 22 work days in a month on average, 21.76, I think to be exact. Um, and you work eight hours a day. Very few people actually only work eight hours a day, but we'll use this for simplicity. So that's 176 hours a month for a full-time employee. We'll round that up to 180 for, for simplicity for sake. A 10% efficiency gain would save 18 hours per month. Make sure I'm doing my math here, right, Mike? Yeah. Per employee. So it, one employee saves 18 hours. If you take a 10-person company with full adoption, we do the same process for 10 people, that's 180 hours a month or one full-time employee a month has been saved by just doing this one exercise. In a hundred person company, that's 1800 hours a month or 10 FTEs. In a thousand person company, that's 18,000 hours a month or a hundred FTEs. In a 10,000 person company, that's 180,000 hours a month or a thousand full-time employees. This is with today's models. OpenAI hasn't improved GPTs in over a year. They launched these things, they added a couple of like tweaks to it, but if you give us OpenAI's existing GPT capability with their existing models, we could do this. Every single company and every single industry, I can't think of a knowledge worker we could drive 10% efficiency gains for. So now you tell me, how AI won't completely disrupt the job market and the economy in the next two years. The only way it doesn't happen is continued lack of understanding. We have an AI literacy problem. We talk about this all the time. People don't realize GPTs can do this. That is that simple to build a GPT and assist your job. The other factor is human resistance to change. Mm, yeah. So these may slow things down in some industries, but the tech can transform. The probability of disruption is too high to do nothing because in this scenario, we just need fewer people doing the same work. So the way we think about it is like, everybody has this choice. You can keep doing what you're doing, or you can accept that you can change things and you accelerate your AI literacy and capabilities and you become kind of AI forward. So if you want to go through this exercise for yourself, just this is why I created the jobs GPT uh, tool. So you can go to smarterx.ai and, and slash jobs GPT, or just go there and click on tools. You can put your job title in there and it'll break down for you the different ways you can use generative AI and it gives you like an exposure key. I think this is critical stuff. Like this is, it is doable today. We're doing it in our own company. I've said this before. We have eight employees now. We function like a team of probably 30 to 50 people yeah. in terms of what we're able to accomplish in a day or a week. And every company can do the same thing. I love how you laid this out. Not only the math, but also isolating 
what's going on here. Like either people don't understand the math or don't know this is possible, which is a lack of awareness. Um, or like you said, they do know it's possible, but there's resistance. Or there's not there's, telling anybody. <laughs> right. The, it's striking to me that this is the absolute baseline scenario that is a, a layup today right. to do. And it's already showing in the numbers. That's essentially a 10% reduction in the amount of people you need for in at theory. least the current stuff. So yeah, if you don't I, produce more. Yeah. I would be, if, that would be eye opening alone to me, especially if I was someone understand, I understand the resistance. Um, but unfortunately, I think if you resist long enough, what's going to happen is someone else is going to make the decision for you of right. how your continued employment, I would think. It's such a competitive advantage for the companies that think about this and say, wow, like, okay, let's do that. Now, again, our whole positioning is don't get rid of those 10 FTEs or 100 FTEs. Right. Like go into new markets, create new products, pursue campaigns you didn't have time to run. Like everybody's got more work than they know what to do with. So have a plan, be proactive in redistributing, reskill, upskill, like we talked about in the first topic, um, and prepare those people to, to create additional value for the organization. Don't just look at it and say cut. But I'm also a realist that publicly traded, venture-backed, and, and private equity-owned companies will cut people. That is right. Inevitable. Right. We've are, we're already starting to see headlines this year of plans to not hire any more engineers, to reduce yeah. workforce from, and it's going to be from tech companies first. That's where we're always going to hear about it. And so you're starting to see that occurring already.